Wow, well, tough one, man. Where do you want to start, man? <laughs> <laughs> this, this, is this is not a complaint, This is not a cry for help. <laughs> Are lower wage workers in Singapore being underpaid? This is your daily catch up. <laughs> Boom. So this episode is sponsored by the Ministry of Manpower Singapore. Today we have a very special guest with us, and he's none other than Minister of sorry, Senior Minister of State. Oh, oh the most oh, the senior it's okay, you know. I purposely did it wrong to break the ice. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's broken. <laughs> it's okay. We have a very special guest with us today, and he's none other than the Senior Minister of State for Manpower, Zaki Muhammad. Hey, hey, hey welcome. Hey, hey, hey. So he's here to help us understand how Singapore is tackling income inequality, the concerns of lower wage workers, as well as how the progressive wage model could be a game changer for them. But first, let's get to know SMS a little better. Did you always want to be a politician? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> the, the answer came quite fast, right? Yeah. So yeah. What, is it about what changed your so mind? So they though? found you, lah. You know, the, the opportunity came about, and no thought how, about how it. How does such opportunity come about? <laughs> man, <laughs> ah, like like good. a pop up, then you click, man. Like, oh <laughs> shit! <laughs> <laughs> it's not a scam. <laughs> we didn't have fishing then. <laughs> mm. I was in the private sector, and I was I, I came in as an MP for right. for sixteen years, and then. After that, came into you know cabinet, and that that was actually the bigger bigger question now in terms of you know why commit yourself to the organisation and commit to the country. I think it's really um, if you think about you know many of my cabinet colleagues or even Mr Lee Kuan Yew how they committed themselves to the prosperity of the nation and Singaporeans. I think that's really quite commendable, and I didn't know whether I, that's something I could commit to as well, because that's really a heavy commitment. You know, giving yourself to the country. To be like Bruce Hood, huh? A bit, a bit. <laughs> Speaking of getting to know you better, right? I think this is the first time like we're meeting you in person. Why is your skincare routine? Your your skin looks impeccable. <laughs> I just it's gonna... water, like all like <laughs> all think, men do. I, I, no, I take no credit. Uh. This, this is like jeans my parents gave me. Uh. Uh, okay, then. Okay, but, but, but 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 if you're asking for 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 beauty tips, it's just soap, lah, basically. Body soap, soap. <laughs> or hand soap? Oh, no, no. It's like Body men are really. So like facial soap is a myth. <laughs> Ah, it's shampoo yeah. as he's doing yeah. it. Yeah, whatever juice on your face. After you that, my wife gave up on me after we got married. Man. <laughs> <laughs> what does your day to day like in the Ministry of Manpower look like? What a tough one, man. Why is it boring? Is, is it, it called, too many called, things? It's called Pakaleo, everything also in. <laughs> <laughs> Where do you want to start, man? No, I think it's, it's quite a broad span. Hmm. And, and we're always on the lookout. La. To me, like I said, now, this, this is really about um, you know, safeguarding Singaporeans' interests. And you, you're always on the watch for. Things. Whether it's someone, you know, um, being displaced from a job or uh, find that employers not treating them well um, or you have migrant workers who are being ill-treated, for example, or workplace safety, you've got uh, safety issues or accidents happen. So, so it's quite a broad space and you just got to keep watch on a daily basis. La. So to me, I think it's really a very meaningful job, but it's not the only job that I do. Because <laughs> you have to be an MP as well. And I've got an MP, I've got my, my, my Ministry of Defence job and we've got Parliament as well. But I no, but I think overall, I think it's... <laughs> it's it's not a complaint, Sesh. Ah. This is not a cry for help. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> not. It's a it's, it's a Pakaleo job, but but it, it's hard to define, basically. That's what I'm saying. But you have no stress lines. It's amazing. God, Sorry, no. I'm, still, I'm still on this. You have very nice skin. Do people recognise you like on the streets and then they come up to you and anybody yeah. scold you before? God. Normally not for much on national issues, lah. I mean, right. but 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 you do get feedback. I mean, my, my <laughs> sense is oh. feedback. Uh, you know, on like uh, you know, hey, you know, now on buy cigarettes very expensive. Uh, you know, your tobacco tax went up. Oh, or, so just know. recently only, right? Yeah. So anything no, you, you with get, the government, anything with the government, you get lah. So I say it's a very parallel job, lah. So they find the nearest government face, then they just yeah, go. Yeah. Some people look for us, bin. Some people call you like, oh, you know, I get an email at night or like. At midnight, and he says, MP having good sleep. Then I, get, I was wondering why. Then so, oh, my neighbor is making knocking, you know, my ceiling, and then no, oh, I'm not having a good sleep because my neighbor is making noise. How so many like, they have your number? <laughs> like no, the email, the email. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. So, so we can <laughs> get things like this. Because <laughs> you go to Gov. Actually, that's the direct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, so get emails. And I say, okay, okay. So how do I answer this one? Like, okay, yes, I'm having great sleep. No, I'm just still awake. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> that's a bit strange. Yeah, <laughs> because no, no, but we do. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I I do get that. So I mean, these are all you know things MPs are quite used to. Um, find part of the job. What do you think were some of the more challenging moments that you've had in your career so far? I think this uh, what we're going to talk about today. I think is something that um, you know really resonated with many Singaporeans. It's something we really want to do, um, especially when we did it during the COVID situation, where we looked at essential workers and we said you know actually we could recognize them better, pay them better, and right. this is where we may want to tackle, you know, in income inequality here in Singapore. So I thought that was one of the 
um, biggest missions that we had, um, reviewing the framework for low-wage workers you know, through the Chapatek work group. And that that was really one one of the biggest, I mean, or the most, most significant policies that I worked on. Uh. Right. So currently, the one that has been talked about a lot is the progressive wage model, right? Do you think you can maybe, for people who don't know, how would you explain that? I'll start with the model itself. Mm. One is, uh, you know, you, you, you start off with the, the best salaries that each market can bear. Setting a wage that, you know, that, that's progressive, that has multiple ladders. The higher you get to, the better trained you are, mm. um, you progress. So that's where there's a bit of difference between our approach and many other countries where it's just a single, single line, uh, minimum wage and every job that pays minimum wage, okay, that's good enough. Yeah. Right. The question we ask ourselves is if you're in the cleaning sector, what would be a good wage that market can bear as well? Mm. There's a different market price for each sector too. So it's a very practical way of doing it as opposed to just setting one line. If you set a minimum, you've got to set uh, based on the minimum denominator or lowest common denominator. I'm going to my primary school maths. Yeah. <laughs> lowest mm. common denominator. What everybody can bear. Yeah. So mm. therefore, you're always stuck at the minimum number. Mm. Whereas different sectors can go higher and you should let those sectors go higher. And that's why right. we have progressive wages. So there's a big difference there in terms of concept as to why do you just want to give the minimum? And, you know, do you want to just give the minimum or do you think we can push it further? Then I say, yes, you know, I, I think I can do better. I should find the best deal for the worker to what the sector can bear. I try to change the job roles and transform the sector so that people don't feel, hey, this kind of job, uh, why you want to do this kind of job? Mm. Right, so you want to transform sectors as well, uh, and therefore these are part and parcel of why we take the extra effort. Sorry, so how does so how does PWM choose the industries? When we first started about ten years ago, it was really the license industry. So how long have you been doing this, ah? Uh? <laughs> 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 Spent like, huh? Yes, yeah. After 12, 15 years ago, then, but, then but, in twenty twenty eight, we will see. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, you're, you're you're not wrong. So, so 2012, we started this and, and it was very new then. It was really licensed industries and you, you, they were trying to, you know, get people on board with a new concept. So your low-wage workers actually rose faster than median. I think it's about 4.7% wage growth for low-wage workers on top of inflation. And then your median was about 2%. In the coming few years, like I said, if you look at nominal wage growth, they will see anywhere between 2 to 80%. So it starts shooting up. But because we set the ground already, and now that the industries are all you know familiar with this, you can then start to accelerate a bit. It's like cars, you know, you drive, you start with gear one, gear two, right? And then once you are comfortable, you go to gear three, four, five. And so it's really like ramping up. So we were able to do that in 2021 because the employers for these sectors understood what it meant and how you can use wages as well as skills upgrade and do changes to the industry. Otherwise, the employers will not agree to this. And mm. this is where I think we are a bit unique. In many countries, when you talk about wages and all government says oh this is the minimum wage and then you all comply lah, right mm, yeah in Singapore it's different in the sense that we we also take a bit of the uh, Scandinavian models they actually have uh, negotiated outcomes so they negotiate between the unions and the employers so we have a bit of that so you have NTUC and employers negotiate what do you think you know both sides can agree to mm. employers know like, consumers can take certain market price for that sector yeah. and the unions say okay uh, this is a good wage outcome mm. is it fair for my workers then you come to consensus. So that's why when I say we can do this kind of jump, but it's not because the government says so. Uh, it's because they say the market yeah. says, I think I can bear this. So we started with the license sector, security, cleaning, and then landscape. And then we had leaf and technicians. Right. So these are all re- uh, regular sectors. Then we moved on. Then recently after this chapter work group, we then moved on into non-licensed sectors. Uh. So that's mm. where we cracked our heads uh, and said, hey, um, yeah. the rest of them have got uh, consumer impact. Uh. So you can be very careful with this. So you have food services, like your fast food, yeah. your, your central kitchen. Then you got, most, if anyone was going to complain about increasing prices, this is where <laughs> this it's going to be. Retail is the other one, <laughs> right? Also, we have a lot of impact. But these are all quite meaningful sectors. Uh, and then we have the occupational ones. So admins, drivers. These are all the sectors that we put in place to say, okay, these are where, like I say, top, bottom 10 type jobs uh, that we can make a difference and make an impact. Then we try to raise them up. Uh, then this will... And then I suppose impact the rest of the market hopefully whether it's LQS what's LQS? local, local qualifying salary. salary as the baseline right. as whether it's other moves uh. so all our other moves put together we will have about 94% coverage of the market so when it comes to the local qualifying salary which is uh, what you mentioned just now is like the base pay per industry right? Uh, that's base pay across all those who are not covered by progressive wages oh okay yes okay. so progressive wages is where we push everyone's salary up 
Then for those that you don't have uh, progress, progress salary, it's a catch-all uh, below. Mm. Right? But that's uh, like a catch-all. Oh, so there is some form of minimum, minimum salary. Okay. Yeah. So the, there is some form. So we're saying that every, so actually every rung of these is a minimum wage. So I say we, we, we take the best of breed, not just, uh, you know, from the West, but everywhere in the world. So we take the best of breed from the West. Okay, there's a minimum rung or minimum wage for every single progressive wage that you have out there. Yeah. And there's multiple ladders. And then you negotiate this with the market so you can push it up to how the market can bear rather than just leave it at minimum. So I think the Singapore way is really about taking the best of breed, learning from the best, uh, from, from out, what's out there and see how we can improve it to, to make the outcomes, f- you know, much more equitable. Uh, best for Singapore. At the same time, you know, you don't disadvantage the employers and you have something that I think we can build as our uh, own unique solution. And a little bit more sustainable for the consumers because like, consumers. like you said, specific sectors, all of it can't increase at a certain, like all the same rate because then suddenly the market might beat them instead. Right. But do we know how much of this cost is, for example, borne by government subsidies versus the employer versus the consumer? Hello everybody, stop right there unless you are about to progress in your wages, guys. <laughs> like, share and subscribe, turn on your notification bell. And okay, back to the episode. Pew. Yes, we do. <laughs> we did the study. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> I know, it was quite significant. You already had some ways in which government knew this was going to be a problem and therefore we subsidised this. Um, I'm not sure whether you guys are familiar with this, but most of our workers in the lowish workers will know they get this thing called workfare. So workfare um, gives the government top up, and that was meant so that you know they get additional salary f- incomes from the government based on your age and based on your salary. Um, you can get up to four thousand two hundred dollars per year. That oh. translates about three hundred fifty a month on average. Mm. So imagine this: if you earn a thousand plus, you can get a top up of three fifty a month. And because the government tops it up, there is minimal impact to the consumer or to the business. Right. So therefore, the worker gets extra but at the same time, there's no impact. Lah. But there's, there's a limit to this lah, because again, this is also, uh, while it's significant, we spend billions a year, it's not sustainable if you have to put taxpayer dollars to just yeah. subsidize yeah. everyone all the time. Mm. So there has to be some parts of it that consumers and market bears. Lah. That's why we talk about progressive wages. Lah. So the wages have to go up but at the same time, government tops up a bit so that you minimize the impact to the consumer. So that's one way in which we help in terms of economics. Lah. When you talk about the, because there's upskilling involved, right? Mm. Like, is that provided by the employers or? So government subsidizes upskilling. So we have this workfare skill support scheme. I pay, we pay about ninety five percent of ninety five percent of their wow. absentee costs, payroll right. costs. I think through Skills Future, you can get anywhere between seventy to ninety percent um, s- subsidy for courses. So, mm. so, so the, we leave it to the employer to decide. Um, you know what kind of courses are available or what they should go for because the employer knows like, what's what's most relevant to the mm. company. Every right, company right. got different requirements, right? Yeah. But of course, for certain sectors like licensed sectors, you know we set what's minimum requirement. Like. So if you want to be security, there's a minimum requirement you have to go for compliance. Mm. You want to upskill yourself to a different level, you take a different course. And of course, there will be other courses that employee can decide to put you through and government supports this. So there's very little excuse for employees to say, uh, you know, I can't afford this because actually government is subsidizing 70-90%. And at the same time, for absentee payroll, we cover them for being absent as well. Mm. So this is how we, we end up supporting the upskilling and training. So that's why we want to help this transformation. But what if, okay, say this hypothetical scenario yes. where I'm a very capitalistic, profit-driven employer, right? And then I Would just... Would you understand? I just, <laughs> <laughs> and then so I hire like maybe 10 cleaners, for example. But then I feel like for this area, actually I only need one person to be able to operate the machine. Lah. Then everyone else is just forever stuck at the lowest rung of the ladder. Then I don't need, I don't feel the need to send them to upskilling and then I therefore don't need to pay them more also. Then mm. doesn't this just end up being... a uh, no change in the system. Well, I would say then you are thinking wrong because then you're not a good businessman. La, because you don't, you forget that you have competitors out there that's willing to take people too, you know, in the tight labor market. Right. And therefore, the rest of the market will just mark on your market share because all you're doing is just regular cleaning. Whereas everyone else moves to a different uh, way of right. cleaning in which I can pay my workers better. I can gain market share because I've got a service that's more productive, that's an offering that people want. And higher skill. And higher skill. And therefore, you're not the only player in the market. Lah. And that's precisely why you have progressive wages. Lah, because you set the minimum salary. So if I set it at a certain level and you have to pay 2004 do you still want the worker to still do the old ways or you think it should be more productive? 
I get this question all the time from employers too, right? Hey, I pay my worker better. Is the uh, does he be- or does he or she become more productive? You know. So the answer would be: It's not just about whether the worker is productive, but it's your business productive mm. because there's a limit to how much I can also train the worker. But if your processes, your automation, the way you work, uh, is not productive, then overall, you know, you're not going to find your business productive, and you know, you you'll find that the cost is not manageable. But if you can structure your business well, do job redesign put in use of tech and some of these things and as a sector you're also productive mm. then I think you, you can make the economics work yep. um, I pay my workers better people need to prepare to pay and then government comes in with subsidies whether it's work fair to do top up whether it is uh, PWCS where we subsidize companies in the short term for wage increases and you know some of these other measures that we do in terms of national subsidies for healthcare, education, housing, and so forth. So, I think you put the whole package together. I think you can, we can make it work. The next question would be: You would probably ask me then the older workers how la? Mm. <laughs> can they cope, right? <laughs> uh-huh. mm. And that's why I say some of these transformation has to take some of this into account la, Whether you know, um, like security, for example. Mm. You know, because you're using technology, you don't have to walk so much, so many times around because, you know, it, it, it is less physically demanding and taxing. The moment mm. you can use technology and sensors and drones and everything else. So, the options are all there. Um, but is that what the market wants? The market will have to evolve because, again, otherwise you're going to have um, higher costs at low productivity. Okay, so you're going to take on the higher costs as a society that's maturing anyway. I think you have so to let's balance take the Yes higher productivity as well. Like, is you, that what you're saying? The, the reality is this. Uh, this is no longer the Singapore that we we were in in 1965. There are a lot of technologies that are so commonplace today. There's no excuse to say, I don't want to do this. Uh. So therefore, you know, so, mm. so, so the reality is that how do I then deploy this in a very um, cost-effective, productive manner? Because now we are, our cost of living is not the same as before. Mm. So if I need, you know, our workers to, to get there, do I want to be like, one of those countries that just says, just put the minimum wage and forget, then do whatever you want with it. Or do I say, you have a chance to shape your sector, pay your workers better, be more productive, I subsidize their skills, training. And at the same time, I think as consumers, we've got to think about, maybe pay a bit more, but the industry and sector there has to also think, given what the, what the consumers are prepared to pay, and what I need to pay my workers fairly, what is the level of transformation we need to put into place? Now? Whether I need to then think about being more productive, how do I maximize, you know, the output uh, using things like technology, automation and things like that mm. to make this work? So I said, that's why I talked about, you know, how do you make the economics work? Uh, and that's why we are putting a lot of effort uh, to help companies transform. And to me, that's, that's one part of this. And uh, that's on the wages part. If you think about the company part, there are a lot of schemes for companies too, uh, like productivity solutions and all that. So those are ways in which we subsidize companies for adopting technology right. as well. So... There are, there are a few moving parts to which we are trying to make this work. And I think this is how, you know, we we, we have to work with, uh, you know, industries, employers, capitalistic ones included. Mm, <laughs> uh, all of them. All of them, yes, to, to make this work. Can you help me break it down? Mm. I mean, I, I would like to think I sort of understand it, right? And because Singapore attracts the ultra wealthy, right? So our equality of income will always be skewed. And that's not a terrible thing because they come here and yeah, they buy up the best houses, but they also spend a lot of money. And so in turn, they pay a lot of taxes, for example. Um, so with that, from your lens especially, what's the importance of trying to bring down income inequality, which will always exist? Sure, but let me segment that. You have What you're talking about is the ultra-wealthy. You've got the vast um, middle-income group. And where, where I'm talking about, where we're dealing with is that bottom 20%. Right? Mm-hmm. And one of the first things I noticed when we looked at the policy and you know we talked about incomes and you look at the bottom 20% we go actually when I segmented what are the jobs or the top 10 bottom jobs in these sectors and many of them were actually domestic facing so you look at cleaning security uh, landscape lift mm. engineers you know, and so forth it domestic drivers. facing as in their work impacts like the their, local their work is actually a, a dependent on you know domestic Singapore like basically Singaporeans right. you know consume these services you know, right. Right. right whereas many of the jobs are better paying tend to be market facing or international. Right. So you don't you don't have problems with say for example lawyers and uh, professional services, for example, IT, tech and all that. Mm. And there's always a there's always a balance between wages and what consumers are prepared to pay. Mm. So those are questions that sometimes we have to ask ourselves philosophically, right? How do we manage this? Because it's not such a simple thing mm. when you just say, you know, let's raise wages. 
and uh, you know you 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 then impact cost of living because then because this like I said uh, they're all domestic facing mm. the upper end that's been market facing have grown because Singapore has prospered we are international hub so you pay international prices because you mm. sell goods and services at international rates yeah. so to some extent if you think about that that I think causes what we call you know the dual shifts in wages uh, so one moves faster than the other one mm. so the other one has not caught up. So the question is, how do we then convince you know um, businesses and Singaporeans as well? How do I then shift that focus and see how we can up this group and help this group and bridge inequality? Bridge inequality. On the note of like income inequality, right, Professor Tommy Ko, mm. he actually did an interview last August, if I'm not wrong, and he actually mentioned that. So this went a bit viral because he called like Singaporeans snobbish. Then he said like we look down on the lower wage workers and then he said we overpay the brain workers and underpay the hard workers. Yeah. Yeah. So Everything he says becomes a straight times like front page. Like, yes, like, yeah, yes, yeah. Yeah. And he said that this is because like essentially Singapore is a hierarchy hierarchical society. How to pronounce society? Hierarchical. hierarchical. Yes, hierarchical society that's ruled by money. Do you think that that's something that you have observed like in your time in politics? Ooh, spicy. Well, there, there is a way the world works. I mean, not saying this is how it should work, but I think it's um, that, that there is also room for compassion and room for us to, you know, uh, decide how we want society to develop. I mean, we are a young country. That's that's one of those advantages. And we are a small country too. So we talked about earlier about you know inequality and how mm. most people don't disagree with that. Most people understand that. So the question is, you no, know, do I? Can I do things differently? Are there things that we can be different from other countries and say, yeah, this is the way Singapore works. Mm. So you also mentioned that it was during the pandemic period that we realised that essential workers are essential. <laughs> As in this True. term pretty much only came about during yeah, yeah. the pandemic but then essentially they are also... also graphic designers. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> I was about to say artists. Mm. Yeah, so a lot of these essential workers actually involve all the lower wage workers in Singapore mm. and is it that we have not put enough of a spotlight on this previously? Prof. Tomiko probably has a point in terms that we, we, we didn't really think about this group enough, you know, and every time when we think about, okay, should the conservancy charge go up or do I, am I willing to pay more for, for food? Am I willing to pay more for services and all that? I think it's also worth thinking what that implies to many of our workers who depend on them. So, you know, if you remember our early days uh, after post-independence, you almost had nothing. We had to build a country out of, you know, farming and whatever that we had, you know, and your shipping ports and... Uh, mosquito coil, right? Uh, uh, mosquito coil or wholesale <laughs> trade. <laughs> 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 Anything else? Now then we went into manufacturing with chips and semiconductors, you know, mm. and then we, we, we knew there were certain skill sets you need and you need to educate the population. Otherwise, you can't fill jobs. I mean, you could have companies investing here, whether it's petrochem, whether it's manufacturing. And you notice where all these investments came from. They were all market-facing, right? international markets. So if you are in those sectors, well, you're probably paid international type salaries because you're delivering services to the international market. Right. But of course, you know, if you look at the domestic market, we talked about that, you know, that, left, that was left behind to some extent because A, you know, to some extent, we enjoyed a certain cost of living. <laughs> Mm. You know, with hawker food, uh, with uh, you know, you know, with, with with retail outlets and heartland stores and all that. So we 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 were fortunate to 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 have kept that for some time. Right now, I think as the country develops, I think it's useful to review and whether this social compact is what we want to continue with, and how do you develop a more equal Singapore, and how do we then you know help others to progress as long as we prosper. So it's not really about how much you want to push up uh, the salaries, but how how do I bridge, right, your bottom 20% closer to the median? And that's that was one of the indicators that we looked at. As you rightly pointed out, you know, the essential workers that were spotlighted during the pandemic, if that group disappears or that group decides not to work, the country can be put to a standstill as well. So, so, so I think it's about time. Um, as you talk about this new social compact that we are trying to build for fairer Singapore and a mm. more just society, um, can we do something different? Mm. Do you think that, okay, maybe not just <laughs> as a Mezaki, <laughs> right? Like, do y'all think that there's an association between like getting paid less and that people thinking that there's no dignity in that job? You know what I mean? Because that, I feel like, is the local sentiment towards, like, cleaners, towards security guards. Like, they feel like it's a job that people don't want to do. So, my, my thoughts on that would be progression. I feel like the societal perception of low-dignity jobs 
uh, jobs that you feel like even if you do very well for 5-10 years you're still doing that I, I feel like it's that I feel like um, I feel like we've gotten kinder as a society to not look down on people and all that stuff like in the past like it, what, it was like channel 8 drama right and then everyone just accepts it also right um, now it's not so much like that but now it's a bit more silent a bit more insight right when you see a very close friend date this guy then you ask him what does he do for a living you hear that and then you will do that silent judgement right of whether got dignity no dignity this job right not as vocal as last time and I think it has a lot to do with the climb is there a climb or not yeah so like even advertising not known for being paid well but a lot of rungs to climb a lot of places to jump to yeah. But you say even for that, right? Like say in Australia, being a plumber, I'm forever being a plumber, but my pay because it's 80k per year is not a job that people look down on per se. Right. But there's also a price to it. Like you, know, you haven't asked the big question, how much do you pay for each plumbing job? Oh, yeah. Yeah. how much so in, the consumer pay? So in Australia, uh. for example, uh, the labour, anything that requires labour is really expensive. Like I remember moving there for the first time, right? And my family members who lived there said, if you actually get into a car accident, right? And like you break your car door, it's cheaper to just replace it than to do the normal like uh, suction out, you know? Oh. Because it's so expensive to get someone to do that. Interesting. Because I was, I was looking at like the pay comparison. So for example, Okay, like maybe plumber is not as accurate to Singapore, right? Then, like cleaner wise, a cleaner is paid about like fifty five k per year, which comes down to four plus k per month. Yeah, right. in Australia, but say for example for food or for transport, right? The max is like twenty percent difference in the cost of living. Like I mean, Australia being more expensive, lah. So clearly the wages, as in the percentage of the the wage gap there and here versus the percentage of cost of living gap is still larger, ma. So I give you an example, lah. Um, sometimes I get this question: Hey, how come, uh, you know, you pay your cleaners in the hawker centre so like like that, like thousand plus? How to survive? Mm. But I say if you're paying four fifty three three bucks plus for noodles and all that, how do you, how much do you think they can earn so that they can pay the cleaners and the storeholders as well? Yeah. Mm. So there is a there is a cause and effect, lah. Whereas if you look at overseas, you realize the costs are not the same, uh, and and therefore they're paid better. So there's always, as I said, domestic domestic market, uh, mm. There's a there's a there's a link between how much you pay people and how much your food prices and everything else costs. There is a direct correlation. Uh, you have to ask yourself that question too. So that's why if you think about why you know many of these uh, developed countries have got very DIY culture. You notice that uh, they build their own house, they do their own renovations. That's true. Because it's too expensive to ask someone it's too to, do it. to do it. Yes. Right. Uh, unlike us, we we we've, we've always like I said, we, we we've had the benefit for many years uh, of uh, cheaper costs to do a lot of these things. Uh, so therefore, you know, we have to also think about the impact of wages against cost of living against, you know, standard of life <laughs> and then how that evolves. I think it's quite sad though. Like, I mean, there are certain things that we can try and 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 change. But then if it's the natural, like the way the market is 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 moving, right? And and you have like supply, demand and all these other factors and cost increasing. Like the other day we were talking to a, a, a hawker and he was telling us about how like there's a possibility that in 20 years time or 30 years time, Chakwetia will no longer <laughs> exist. It will go extinct. Right. But it's like something that is Bopian one, ma. Because like how much will you really be willing to pay for for that, you know? I'm also pessimistic about this, honestly. So one of those things I was quite surprised. Actually, once we had these conversations with the labor movement, with employers, and say, hey, actually, uh, this is not about salary, this is about income inequality. If I don't bridge this, there is a wider implication to Singapore. You see in many countries instability. When you know there's an underclass that set that, that, that comes into play and then you know they get upset and then you have a lot of um, social issues that come about. So um, so this was how we got employers on board. You know, it's like, hey, you know, we need to tackle this together. It is also about two things. One, we will help you to try to educate the consumer to say, hey, all of us have a role in this. Mm. Right? It's 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 that. Second one for employers, they have a role in this because as we do this, there's a social mission. And when we did this, it was um two years ago. So we, we were still in the midst of COVID. And can you imagine what employees were thinking on the minds? Like, hey, already you have this SMM <laughs> thing. I got pandemic. I have no idea how long this will, this will last. But then you're asking me to raise prices. Are you all mad or what? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> so, so, so it's really, uh, so I had to, we had to convince them it's really about social mission. And I'm quite heartened. Uh, every single one of them I spoke to uh, understood this. Okay. You'd be surprised at how, even while in the pandemic, this actually we, they agreed to anywhere between 50 plus percent which increases to Whoa. 80 plus which increases oh. for some of these sectors oh, over wow. a five six year period yes so n people don't quite realize this because we just started this in the last one two years but you will see the impact when we hit 2028 
So, okay. if I, uh, so if I give you the example, uh, cleaning today, you probably at about 1,005, 1,006, right? Mm. But by 2028, you'll be somewhere about 2,004. If I talk about security, they're about almost 2,000 today. Mm. By 2028, they'll be about 3,005. Oh, wow. Mm. Can you imagine security for the intro? But, but, but the difference is your question, uh, dignity. Uh, do you I look at the job differently by then? Because today, when you look at the security guard, you think it's a jaga seat by the gate. Hey, you know, what's he doing, right? It's like, this kind of job, is it dignified? I mean, the question, sometimes in your mind, and that's where stigma comes in. But actually, today, if you think of security, they are one of the most transformed jobs, you know, today. They they deal with CCTV cameras, they use sensors. They are quite high tech. It's quite so high tech now. Quite yeah. high tech these days. And you can do a lot of things with security nowadays with, uh, you know, tech. So therefore, with that knowledge of tech, I now upskill you. You now have certain skill sets. You no longer just the jaga. <laughs> then the 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 perception changes. And if I can do that across the sector, and all of us as buyers uh, think of the job very differently. Um, then I think that's where dignity comes in. Perception changes. Mm. Landscape is another one because we always think of landscape horticulturists as the guy who just you know deals with the plants. But today you cut look grass. cut grass. <laughs> but these days, you know, if, if you look at some of the horticultures that we have in our estates, are uh, very colorful plants. They actually know the species and how to true, shape this, true. and you know how what kind of plants work best in what kind mm. of situation. So, so I think many many people are good in their hearts, but the question is how do you make the economics work? Ah, so that is the key question. Like, can you all make the economics work? Ah? Mm. Okay, what I was thinking, right, is... And you see whether you're prepared to go that far to agree with me. Okay? <laughs> we have reached a point in Singapore ah, where we are doing okay as a country, right? But then, in order for us to enjoy the cost of living we have today, there's a segment of society that's paying a price. Lah, and that is taking really low wages so that the rest of society can continue this very, very low cost of living, right? And so, where we're at is that it first begin with the progressive wage model, right? Which was Singapore's answer to minimum certain wage. calls for a minimum wage program where let's let's have a minimum wage all across Singapore. Um, and then Singapore saying, no, the inflation for that will be insane and among any uh, many reasons. And so, we did it uh, we did the progressive wage model in a way where it's very targeted. There is still um, a minimum, but there is need for training, improvement, upscaling, and then increase in productivity and then increase in pay. La. So far, correct, right? Um, not entirely, but carry on. <laughs> <laughs> so where we're at now is that as a society, there is a, there is a leap we need to make to reconcile the bottom 20% to the rest of society, the middle and above of society and so what is being done to a certain extent and this is where it gets uh, really dicey right is that we are putting all the players in certain industries and then we are price fixing to say that in three to five years from now we will all increase our price to about like that hence your can pay your workers better to a certain extent, is that what we're doing? Okay, so so to some extent, you're absolutely right. You know, in terms of um, where we're headed, but mm. just 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 a few corrections. One, the progressive wages were in place about 10, 10 years ago. So I said twenty twelve. Workfare we put in about ten years as well. Um, so some of these things were already there, but largely because we had to, we wanted to also protect, like you said, like, you know, the wages of certain sectors because there is potential depression. We didn't jaga the thing. Because there is also, you know, there's always market pressures. You're absolutely right. And there's expectations of Singaporeans that you want to keep some of these costs lower. And therefore, as soon as we already saw the trend about 10 years ago, and therefore progressive wages or PWMs came in. Um, we had this thing called the full-time equivalent salary as well in the old days. Uh, in the sense that before we had LQS, this was in place for about 10 years as well. So if you want to hire a foreign worker, you have to pay my local worker X. Mm. And that was one way in which we prevented depression of wages. Because as you know, if I brought in a cheaper foreign worker, the last thing he wants for Singapore to lose his job. So mm. you want to hire the foreign worker, can to qualify for DRC for, or the ratio, you have to pay the Singaporean worker minimally this amount. So we had this for many years as well. So what we did was, when we did the whole progressive wage, we also tried to modify some of the levers. Uh. But more importantly, the sector wages were meant to be able to push as far as you can within the sectors. So to some extent, you're right in the sense that I, 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 that there is not so much price fixing, but it's more wage fixing. 
And then the price is a function of how productive your company can be and how best you can set your right. price without the com- without the company right. collapsing. Uh. So, so when you mentioned the other that way around. It's so the other way around. I set the wages yeah, and then okay. you you then, then I give you money to upskill your workers so your workers can be productive. I upskill you money to do automation and change your company's working model. So how productive you can be is a function of how the company charges. But that levels the playing field because to some extent, you know, the guy who wants to charge lowest will, will not raise the salaries. Lah. And that's why you find this depression for a long time because mm. as a consumer, you know, any consumer logically uh, and honestly will want the, the best deal. It's a very practical thing. It's a very, mm. you know, any consumer will want the best deal. But at the same time, if you don't uh, do some level of protection, this is what happens uh, when you have a lot of our domestic facing sectors as I said, actually having very low wages because all of us want the best deal. But at the same time, I need to make sure that they're adequately protected. Yeah. Uh, if I don't do that, then you know everyone's just going to charge lowest and it's just a dive to the bottom. So yeah. we have to be responsible consumers as well. Like, yeah. And that's why we have things like the progressive wage mark as well. I think where my internal frustration, because I, I did have to read up a little bit about the, the progressive wage model and the and the mark that you mentioned. And I think where the, the frustration for me on behalf of you, I guess, and I don't know why, I guess it's for my citizenship like application, um, is that people who call for minimum wage um, probably don't foresee the the inflationary like impact it might have on the economy. That's one. But the second thing is that they're saying, like, why doesn't the government just implement it? Like, it's so much easier actually if the government just did it. And the amount of work that you guys are going through, like talking to NTUC, talking to the employers, setting that which, um, and all that, and to actually just like look through which sector is the one to target first, and and all that. It takes so much work to so much more work to do this because of the benefits that you guys see and like. It's, it's just so strange that there's still calls for like, I oh yeah, just implement a minimum wage. Where like, if the government wanted to, they would have done it already. It's like, it's just so much easier. Um, but you mentioned about the mark, which is something that we've begun to actually see pop up in like um, malls already. So this um, progressive wage mark is very, very special to, to us and our company because it is. Um, we kind of designed and shot the campaign for it as well. Um, among other things, there's this music video, right? Which with uh, Annette and Taufik and the song was stuck in our head for the longest time. <laughs> so is. please go and watch the music video, right? Then you will see, right? There's the PW mark. And then there's someone inside dancing. <laughs> I want to say that and if that person is Dan. Uh, he has volunteered himself because uh, the production budget was running thin, maybe. It we, was running thin. too and much money in, on lights. <laughs> I was the project manager and I was looking after the budget and so I was like, let's save. Let's <laughs> so we have the progressive wage model which looks at these sectors and makes sure that training and progression happens. And now we have the progressive wage mark. And what this mark is, is an invitation to the public to recognise that these are the employers, right, that have taken that step to make sure that they train their employees, to make sure that their employees have progressive training and wage growth so that it's sustainable, right? We're not just paying people more and more and more. We're making sure that they are more and more productive as well, right? And so what this entire campaign is, is a mark that recognises this employer and hopefully us as the public, when we see this mark, that we would support this business because we know that this business are recognising, are recognised, have recognised and are helping um, the industries that contain many of Singapore's bottom 20 percenters. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. First, I just want to say a big thank you for supporting the PW Mark. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really one of the toughest, um, you know, pieces of the puzzle because you know, as we talked about, many of these are domestic facing, and a lot of the, you know, we've always tried for the longest time to avoid cost impact to the consumers. Yeah. Mm. But you know, as you increase wages at a certain point, when I can say now, you know, for some of these sectors, you're gonna have fifty to eighty percent wage increases in the next five years. The time will come. The now. time will come when consumers have got to ask, they actually have to support them too. There will be impact. So there's a, there's, there's a limit to how much you can buffer but there will be an impact in time. We hope that consumers, just like you know how you all support fair trade, you know, uh, green companies uh, mm. and all that. So Recyclable we, cups. Recyclable kind of cups shit. and all this. So, so please support this because ultimately this is also our way of supporting our low wage workers and saying, hey, you know, I will support companies who, will, who are doing this. And this is one way for us to also, you know, let our pockets do the talking, like, honestly, because we, mm. we, we do care for them, but I think there's a role that we have to play as well. So sometimes we always want things cheap. I say, yeah, that's practical as a consumer. All of us want a good deal. Yeah. But I think we also want to make sure we have a fair you know, exchange of uh, trade, like, basically means they deliver services and I see how I can support them too. I think that's, yeah. that's one way in which we have to rework our social compact. 
Yeah, and I think that there, there needs to be a little bit of that mindset shift or like that culture shift that maybe we spoke about earlier also where like when when people see the mark, the hope is that people go, okay, let's let's support this business because that's a cause that I want to support as opposed to, oh, I see this mark, oh, means they're going to be charging more expensive now. And then that's completely just the wrong takeaway if like people people take that. Like. So hopefully there's that, that mindset shift also of like trying to find a good deal and that we can come together and rally behind trying to bring up and reconcile that bottom 20%. Question. Yes. So, as I'm curious, like, does this not just become a vicious cycle for the lower wage workers because my wage increase, but then to the bottom earners, it's also more difficult for them to afford things. So, as overall cost of living increases, then does that not negate um, the inflation in their wages? What's well, worse if you if you have inflation and the salary is not going up? Right. Okay, there's inflation. In there. Yeah, okay, okay yeah. You that's a great answer. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, you win. I was like, ah, you got him. <laughs> yes, I've been thinking about it for the past like good five minutes. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't. There there is. <laughs> no, the, the, no, admittedly, there'll be some parts of that, but ultimately, like I said, you know, we have to then think about the whole package. Whether you know you put in education subsidies for their kids to support them, you know, housing subsidies to make flats more affordable. Um, healthcare subsidies and all the key ones I think are important how we manage the essential items for them and of course there'll be some parts that's actually very hard to control because these are inflation which you know, the market sets certain prices but it's worse if uh, in terms of impact if, if the salaries are not increased la. so therefore some of these wages are also computed based on what we think would be a fair you know a fair wage for them for the kind of work that they do okay next question yes so- by the way <laughs> If I think about people with disabilities, right, mm. specifically if they have mobility issues, then say for example they are unable to go through certain upskilling and all that, then wouldn't that just cause a bigger divide in society because they are stuck while everyone is moving? Well, that's a, a tough question to answer because disability. <laughs> <laughs> I can see yes, got him. That's what we're going for actually. No, no. I mean, it's a tough question to answer because the disabilities come in many forms, right? So, so there are different layers and different levels yep. in which you have to deal with. We worry that 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 that. I have personally is that sometimes when you push the boundaries too hard, then employers will say, hey, if you're coming in uh, with certain disabilities, I don't hire you lah because it's just going to be too expensive. Mm. So what we can do is provide subsidies for employers to hire persons with disabilities like enabling employment credit, for example. So that's that's one way in which we, we lend support. But at the same time, you know, I, I also want to urge employers to give our PWDs a chance. Because ultimately, they too can be productive in, in many forms. And today, there are, you, you, you also have the use of assistive technologies. Mm. And there's some bits that consumers need to also play our role too. Lah. Because I, I have seen, you know, sometimes you know, consumers get uh, very upset because, you know, the, the work is slower or they're not fully understanding what you're asking for. Mm. But I think there is, again, you know, how, how we want our society to develop. Do we want to give them a bit of, cut, cut a bit of slack so that employers also have that slack to, to, to play with, to hire PWDs. And so just like progressive wage, I think um, there is a whole triangle there again between the employer, the consumer and the worker. If the consumer is not willing to give a chance, it's very hard for the employer to employ them and say, yes, I want to put them, put them in the front you know, to serve you, but you're not prepared to have them serve you. <laughs> then it's very hard to, for the worker to get employed. So I think this is just like progressive wage. Like you have to almost, you know, put the three together and say we have to set a new norm mm. and that we have to be prepared to say I, I don't mind paying more paying for their services and I'm prepared to cut a bit of slack mm. I think that's, that's, that's be more patient be more patient uh, give the employer a chance too so indeed, this, is, this is a good reflection time so once again thank you very much to the Ministry of Manpower Singapore for sponsoring today's episode and thank you very much Senior Minister of State for Manpower Zaki uh, for you. joining us and sharing with us and answering my tough questions. So we hope that today's conversation has given you more insight into the progressive wage model as well as the progressive wage mark in Singapore. So for more information, you can check out the MOM website down here. We'll also put down like in the description like what are the companies that are credited with the PW mark so that you can support them and drum roll, drum roll for this very important announcement. So we'll be doing our very first TDK session in real life on the the 25th of March and it'll be at Suntech City. So Annette will also be there. I think Taufik will also be there. Yes. And Dan might be performing. No. Uh, no you don't see to find out. You won't yes. know. You see to find so out. So see you there. We'll also put those uh, details in our description. Bye-bye. Like, share, subscribe. <laughs>